Hello and welcome to my presentation on the Autistic Birth Experience Findings from a Self-Reported Survey. My name is Hayley Morgan and I'm a graduate of the MSc Autism and Related Conditions course at Swansea University's Medical School. I'm here to present my findings and a little bit about the project. So we'll continue and look at what this project entailed and what the findings were. For future reference, my supervisors on this project were Dr. Alice Hone and Dr. Gareth Noble at Swansea University's Medical School. As previously mentioned, I'm a graduate of the MSc Autism and Related Conditions course at Swansea University. I have now graduated, but I'm very passionate on this topic, which is why I'm bringing my findings to you today. I'm a late diagnosed autistic woman and mother. I was diagnosed four years ago at the age of 30. After my first birth experience, which is rather traumatic and a slightly improved second birth, I started sharing my experience with those in the community and found that of, more often than not, other autistic women shared my experiences to quite a detailed level of similarity. And I wanted to explore this more in a more scientific way to help improve care, ideally. Before designing the survey, I conducted a systematic literature review. This became quite an expansive part of the project for two main reasons. The first being that there are a number of co-occurring conditions that may affect pregnancy and birth, often present in the autistic population, particularly the female autistic population. Those could include hypermobile joint syndrome, Ella Danlos, and a number of mental health issues such as depression and anxiety. In order to help alleviate any issues with communication, particularly through long form text answers, I decided to use some sliding scale and rating questions in order to better quantify what can be quite an emotional um, account to give. The survey was advertised mainly through my social media accounts where I have a number of contacts, colleagues and peers in the autism community online and the survey was hosted through SurveyMonkey. In total, I had 284 responses, which was absolutely fantastic and really gave a rich wealth of data to analyse. In terms of the demographic of respondents, out of that 284, I decided to clarify early on in the survey whether the participant was self-diagnosed or formally diagnosed. This was to compare the two subgroups later on. The data was then analysed using a mixture of SPSS, Excel and thematic analysis. One of the most important arguments pertinent to the autistic community in current times is the validity of self-diagnosis. So as previously mentioned, I decided to create two distinct subgroups for later compare. And when I did this and ran standard deviation against the responses on the rating scale questions, I found that there were no statistically significant differences between the self-diagnosed and the formally diagnosed respondents' answers. Both were equally negative, and it does suggest that it's possible that current pathways are failing diagnosed autistic women, and also that self-diagnosis is an equally valid form of diagnosis. So in terms of the responses from the pregnancy section, it was quite evident that there were issues with sensory overwhelm and the impact that that would have on communication. This is particularly important to communication in labour for any mum, but this is of quite serious importance to autistic people, especially when you consider an atypical presentation to pain. For example, autistic people will often report a hyposensitivity to true interoceptive pain and have difficulty communicating such, whereas they can also report a hypersensitivity to tactile touch. In labour, this may be exacerbated by things like sensory overwhelm from conditions in the immediate environment. The next theme of concern were answers focusing on a lack of autonomy and reported concerns about consent over being touched. So, for example, 
I felt I had consent about how and when I was touched during observations was met with 40.95% of respondents disagreeing that they had any autonomy over those observations. And for a population that often has higher rates of sexual abuse and other trauma, this is of serious concern when looking at these negative responses. Furthermore, there were also concerns over a feeling of autonomy and in terms of reporting the care and any problems that they had with it. So 51% said that they had concern, if they had concern over the medical practice and weren't happy with their care, that they did not agree that they knew how to complain about that care. And while considering that atypical pain experience in the autistic population, it's also important to note that many autistic women feel a hypersensitivity to the first very early signs of pregnancy. So 42% of autistic women felt that they had interoceptive bodily changes during pregnancy far sooner than that of their neurotypical peers. Now, for a population that can be more prone to issues such as alexithemia and a difficulty in interpreting that internal, internal state, then things like campaign communication and communication over consent and autonomy, this is arguably of concern. In terms of assessing the quality of care involved in birth for autistic women, around 60% stated that they were not confident in the levels of autism awareness of the medical professionals involved. And furthermore, around that figure also stated that they did not feel that the medical professionals involved adequately understood their sensory needs. Now, we previously discussed how important sensory needs are to communication and overall and pain communication. Furthermore, a little over 14% of respondents felt that they wrote their birth plan collaboratively with medical staff. And when you consider the number of co-occurring conditions that may be present, this is of concern. Especially when considering that 27% of women felt well informed during birth. And this mirrors previous concerns over consent and autonomy. And when you're looking at wider factors such as wellness, again, a little over 14% of respondents felt confident in communicating their emotions during childbirth. And in terms of general accessibility, only 8.43% of respondents could agree that adequate accessibility adjustments were made for them during birth. In terms of the autistic birth experience and the postnatal hospital stay, we looked at the issue of responsibility and continuity of carer. For two questions, a little over 12% answered that they felt that their medical professionals involved had time for them when it was needed and also that they knew who was responsible for them during their care. Overall, autistic people reported a very negative evaluation of the care involved, particularly looking at the transition to home with baby. Strikingly, only 2% of respondents felt that their health visitor had adequate autism awareness and also that they felt confident that medical professionals had a positive view about autism or autistic people. In terms of long-term postpartum support, just over 8% felt confident that they received quality care in that respect. And considering that this population is more prone to a number of mental health issues, only 17% of these autistic people agreed with the statement that their postpartum mental health needs were taken into account. Furthermore, when looking at this heterogeneous population with a number of possible co-occurring conditions, a little over 6% could agree with the question that they felt their co-occurring conditions and other long-term co-occurring um, co conditions received adequate, adequate care and planning in the antenatal and postnatal care. Now I'm going to briefly look at the thematic analysis findings of the survey. 
I would suggest that you pause the screen here if you do wish to look at more detail at the codes involved um, from the thematic analysis. However, I will mention briefly some of the latent codes included issues around diagnosis, community and isolation, and some of the semantic codes included pain, trauma, awareness and understanding. The findings around the code for communication and isolation suggest that many of the issues reported in younger life of autistic people and particularly the issues of social communication and social imagination that are needed for an autism diagnosis are still very much present later in life for autistic people having children. This particular code allows us to see an expansion of the previously mentioned issues around autonomy and consent. For example, wider issues such as choosing a birthing venue, self-advocacy and care access. For example, issues around the choice to become a parent at all and stigma around being disabled were also mentioned. Many of the accounts that reported positive quality of care evaluations were often based around a strong sense of autonomy and having a choice as a mother. Adding on to previous accounts that mentioned concerns over the stigma of being disabled, a number of respondents noted that they had concerns about disclosing their autism diagnosis to medical professionals and any potential ramifications that that may have on their care. This is particularly per pertinent to autistic mothers who are more likely to be accused of FII or fictional or induced illnesses um, and concerns of their parenting in general. This suggests that a more robust approach to autism awareness training during pregnancy and birth is needed, particularly at this very vulnerable transition point in their life.